Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta. Of course, my name is Bryce, and I'm here with one of my new friends, Emmy, who I'm going to show you guys before we get into the subject at hand, her awesome channel, Holistic Genie with Emmy. So you guys, she's new to YouTube, but she's not new to the world of spirituality. So go ahead and give her a subscribe. I will have all of Emmy's links down in the description box below. This is in the second time on the channel with me. Um, our friend Stephanie from Spiritual Perspectives of Our Great Awakening has been a little bit under the weather this week. I think a lot of us have, which we're going to be talking about today about what's going on. And so um, we wish her well. But um, I will put a link to that episode that we did previously with Stephanie in the description box as well for you guys. How are you doing, Emmy? How are you doing today? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Um, definitely grateful that I'm aware of what's going on spiritually and scientifically with everything uh, with the ascension, because otherwise I think I would just be a heap of tears. <laughs> I've been dealing with insomnia, which is an old issue. And I can talk a little bit about that when we start um, getting into the energy updates and things. Um, but yeah, how are you? I'm the same as you. And I'm glad that I do know, I know what's going on astrologically as well. And that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. There's some other readers that I've put information out to, but it's super important. And we were talking before we started filming. And I know I've said this many times on my channel and, um, me like Emmy, my, my job off of YouTube. Now YouTube has become my main job, but before YouTube, I I'm the only female, female authorized a stronga teacher in the state of Georgia. And so I've, I've spent many, many years working because as at, when you get into these healing arts, the first person you have to work on is yourself. Is yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the biggest misconceptions that I see um, off camera and shalas and also from people who are new is when you think of spirituality, a lot of times people think you're just all of a sudden going to feel bliss and peaceful and it's going to be in your music, just constantly playing in the background and butterflies and rainbows. That's not till the very end. Like you, you have to get, you have to go through the dark night of the soul. And a lot of times we even have it in um, the courses that I teach I, in the manual, I have a section on the ego death. And how painful that can be, how um, really gut-wrenching that shadow work can be. And astrologically, that's what we're walking into as a collective. And I know I said, um, I think I said it with uh, Catherine, we have three different karmas that we're working with, all of us. Every single human being has three different karmas we're all working with. And karma isn't, all karma is, is cause and effect. That's all it is. It's cause and effect. It's your work. You have your own personal karma, uh, your work that you individually have to go through in this life. You have the residual karma from possibly past lives and you have your ancestral karma. So what you've inherited through your DNA, which is goes along with the Ascension as well. And you have your collective karma, which is the group, which we're going to talk about too, because we all, we are collectively riding a roller coaster right now with mother earth, which you guys have said, heard me say with the law of one earth is also ascending. And this is the one time, uh, apparently, allegedly, in the galactic history where living beings have been able to be on a planet as it ascends. Normally, we have living beings, humans, animals, whatever, have to get off the planet in order for the planet to then shed its skin and ascend. But this is the one time where we're riding it with Mother Earth. So with that being said, there is no precedent. <laughs> we're the guinea pigs. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also, uh, before we get into it too, you guys have heard me say many times in the law of one that they're very clear that a lot of us who are here right now were picked to be here by source, by God, by creator, because we were actually in higher densities and we came down back into a lower density to help push earth forward. So what that means is that all y'all or majority of y'all have already ascended before many times. And so if you can settle into that uncomfortableness and realize this is not your first rodeo, then I think there'll be a little bit more um, of a surrender to the craziness that is going to ensue, the chaos that's going to ensue. But with that, I'm going to let you take it away, Emmy. Okay. Yeah. Um, I will support what you just said um, with, 
the fascinating um, charts that your viewers and Stephanie's viewers had, have emailed me uh, inquiring about aspect pattern astrology. Um, I'm working on them all. Thank you guys so much for reaching out. Please be patient. I am extremely busy, extremely busy. I will get to everyone who has emailed me, but it might be, you know, a few, a few weeks. Um, but what I've noticed thus far is that everyone has these really rare aspect patterns. And it's kind of like, hmm, this is a special group of people, you know, and why wouldn't they be people who watch you and, and Stephanie and other truthers, you know, they're probably awake and aware. And like you said, this isn't our first rodeo, I don't think. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I just wanted to make that known. Um, so yeah, let's get into the energies. Um, so I like to... Um, along with astrology and the spirituality of things, I like to study the, the scientific stuff. And um, the solar activity in the month of April was really active. We had so many flares, so many CMEs. And for people who don't know what that means, a CME is a coronal mass ejection. It's basically a burst of cosmic particles and electromagnetic radiation, you know, burped at, at earth. And it comes in to, um, our ionosphere and this light, the spiritual community calls it light. The scientific community calls it photons. Okay. Um, this light comes into our bodies and interacts with our electrical fields and our, our bio um, electric parts of our body. It, it comes into our cells. It uh, interacts with our DNA. And when this stuff is going on, like I'm going to use an analogy. So if you say you have a, a cup and you've got like maybe one or two inches of really soapy water in the bottom of the cup, you want to bring the soap up and out um, to the surface. So you put the cup under some water and you let the water run into the cup and it displaces the soap. Okay. That's kind of like what's going on with the light coming down. It's, it's entering our bodies, entering our cells, and it's pushing the crud or the soap up and out. Nobody's yeah. immune. Nobody's immune. Detox. It's a forced detox. Yes. It's a forced detox and it works on a, on a, a cellular level with your DNA. So it's just, um, and, and that's where you can get your ascension symptoms like nausea and dizziness and headaches and the ringing in the ears and, um, the, the tiredness, the fatigue, the body aches, all of that integration of all of the, the light is what is causing these symptoms. And I, on, on that note, I will say to you guys, um, well, we've talked about this on my channel before, sickness is a necessary part of ascension. In the East, they talk about this all the time. And in, in my yoga school, the Yoga Shala, they would get excited when you got a fever, you got the yoga fever. That means that your body was, removing old patterns mm -hmm. right and so and that's one thing that the the controllers the bad guys have tried to kind of manipulate you know if we get sick what do we do we immediately try to like put chemicals in our body to stop it mm -hmm. versus just letting it run out and so and that is something that I'm so glad you've and I've been I've been super dizzy like so, like so, like to the point where I'll have to like stop for a minute and like regain um kind of my, my equilibrium. Um, I have been extremely tired. I've been having really, um, interesting sleeps. Um, and so I get that, but we just, you don't try to fight it. Don't try to just let it do what it needs to do. Cause it's creating a new pattern for you. And that's what we want. <laughs> that's what we yeah, want. Absolutely. Um, so a little bit on the scientific side, there is an index called the KP index and it's basically a scale that they use to determine the amount of um, geomagnetic activity or geomagnetic storms. 
last month, the KP index reached uh, seven and it goes from zero to nine. So yeah, right, right, right there. This one? There, I, I can't, I'm pointing at my screen. Oh, I see, I see right here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's funny, uh, KT, and, uh, yeah, because it goes from zero to nine. The nine's down here in the purple, guys, if you can see that. My my uh, computer abilities only go so far. So, <laughs> um, so if you go over two, over two pictures. This one? Yeah, that is a really, really severe geomagnetic storm. And now this isn't, this isn't from April. This is just an example, but right, right. The, those columns are, are the different levels. Green is pretty much safe. Yellow is moderate and red is really high. Wow. I wonder yeah. if we can find April. Yeah. It, it reached seven, uh, level seven, which I don't believe it's reached that level in about a decade. And, you know, don't, don't take my word for that. I haven't looked it up yet, but it's been a, it's been a minute since it's been that high. And <clears throat> when that happens, you know, not only can it affect um, satellites and, um, you know, different pieces of equipment, it can also affect people with, it, it affects our bodies, you know, it, it can yeah. affect people with heart issues or psychological or neurological issues. Um, they actually put out warnings sometimes when the KP index is elevated for a number of days. They'll say, you know, beware, it, it's a, a heart health hazard right now. Oh, wow. Not right now, but they'll put the, the message out that that's what's going on. So that's a little bit about the KP index. And not only was the KP index pretty high last month, but there was also several periods where the photon density or the plasma was really high. Now, I'm going to give another analogy for, for people to, to kind of understand what plasma is. Here's my little guy. Hey, buddy, mama's doing a video. Uh, what happened? Small hand. Are you okay? Want me kiss it? No? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Can you close the door? I think Nothing okay. like a mama's love. Even yeah. if <laughs> you want your kitty. Well, no, don't do that, honey. Pick them up. Here. Hold on. I'll get them for you. All right, so plasma density. Um, I want you guys to think about a liquid. I know light isn't a liquid, but I'm going to compare it to liquids. If you think about water and the, um, let's call it thickness of water or viscosity, it's pretty runny. And then if you think about motor oil, it's more viscous, it's thicker. Yeah. Well, when the plasma density is elevated, it's like the thickness of the light. Like normally it's between one and 10. I'm not going to give the units of measurement because most people aren't going to understand, but it's usually between one and 10. It was upwards of 75 to a hundred last month. And it's like, we have motor oil light coming down. I mean, it is just insane. Insane. Wow. Yeah, really high. And you I know- You can't escape for, that. No, you can't. And I know for me, I get these really weird headaches. It's almost like my head is full of mud, but at the same time, it feels like it's being compressed. I don't even know how to, it's, it's, it's a headache that is not like any other headache. It's just weird. Yeah. Um, so there, there's, there's that as well. So we have all of this light coming down and filling our bodies. This month is going to be the purging of all of the crud or the soap that's coming up and out of your cells. Now, and we're also be, we're also in a, an eclipse sandwich. Yeah. We had a partial solar eclipse on the 30th. 
and we have a total lunar eclipse and full moon in Scorpio on the 15th and 16th. So <laughs> and that's intense, guys. That's yeah. intense. And my I'm, moon sign is Scorpio, so I'm like, ready. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my my rising is Scorpio, and so is my husband's. And it's just like, okay, brace yourselves. <laughs> so um and, and we have a Mercury retrograde coming too. Yes, yeah, I'm gonna get to that as well. So we've got this eclipse sandwich that we're in and eclipse energies do not just stay nice and neat on the day the eclipse happens. It's like, you know, weeks, months, you know, eclipse season, the energies are, um, are very intense, very strong and they intensify other astrological energies and planetary alignments as well. And like what Bryce was saying, Mercury stations retrograde on the 10th. And so we've got, we've got this total lunar eclipse in Scorpio and Scorpio is all about getting to the root of things like way down deep, deep diving, shadow work, that kind of stuff. Mercury retrograde also brings up that kind of stuff for people. And and I think that Mercury retrograde gets a bad name because, you know, it, the planet is amazing. It has these gigantic magnetic spiraling storms that go off. And, you know, so it, it, it interferes with communication. It interferes with electronics, with mechanical things. So, you know, your car can break down, your phone can mess up. I used to work at a chemical plant and this is how I um, found out what mercury retrograde was because every time mercury would go retrograde, we would have three weeks of non-stop issues. Oh, our, I believe our it. computers, yeah. our, our machines, our pumps, like everything would just go haywire. And I started noticing this pattern. And so I looked it up. I'm like, what is going on, you know, in the environment or whatever? And that's when I discovered um, Mercury retrograde. And that's kind of when I started um, diving into a little bit more of astrology. Yeah. So it's very, will, very interesting. For those watching, I get what you're saying, because Mercury retrograde does get a bad rap. And I will say with the technology, just rules of thumb for people, don't buy a new phone or a new computer or a new car during Mercury retrograde. All right. Just let whatever issues you're having with your old systems, just let them be for the time period. Once you're out of the shadow of the retrograde, then it's okay to go buy a new one. Um, but also don't get into new contracts and Mercury retrograde. Mm-hmm. Don't, uh, but old projects, old stuff can come to completion, which is a lot of the pulling up. You think about with relationships, closure, all that kind of stuff, the, the, that chaotic, chaotic inside that's like, starting to pull its, its nasty head back up again, but it's, it's uncomfortable, but it's necessary. It's absolutely necessary. Yes. Yes. So if you can approach this month, um, with a mindset of embracing the stuff that's coming up, because really these eclipses and the mercury retrograde is really just shining a gigantic light on what needs to be healed within you. And it can be really uncomfortable because people are going to be triggered. They're going to be freaking out. Old stuff is going to be coming up stuff that you thought you were over or that you've already dealt with. It can resurface. I'm going to, you're going to have some really intense uh, emotions to process through. And so what I really encourage people to do is when that stuff happens, just observe just observe without attachment, like don't attach to these really strong emotions. And in fact, um, when I started working with emotional regulation and healing myself emotionally, um, I had such a hard time when an uncomfortable feeling would come up, I would do everything to escape it, bypass it, go around. Like I just, I couldn't, I had this really illogical belief that if I allowed myself to feel these really intense feelings that I was going to die, you know, and it's just like, no, that's not the case. So if you have these really uncomfortable things coming up, try to lean into it, like just hold it like a baby, you know, just love everything that's coming up. Say, you know, thank you for this anxiety. Please show me what it is that, you know, I need to to heal or or thank you for this anger. 
you know, please, please show me, you know, what I need to do to, to relieve this. And then just be an observer of other people too. you know, hold space for them. You know, if someone lashes out at you, don't lash back, even though it would be really hard not to just don't take it personally and don't take it personally. Don't take anything personally, just really be an observer this month and be very, very gentle with yourself. Self-care is super, super important. Um, so, you know, don't attach to your feelings, lean in, into them, love them, hold them like a baby. And when you, when you can do that and just allow yourself to sit and be uncomfortable, this really beautiful thing happens. It's like, I imagine like, um, a dandelion poof and, you know, you blow on it. And when you're able to hold these emotions and just lean into it and just allow it to flow, allow it to flow instead of stagnating it or blocking it or trying to escape it, just allow it to flow. It like, there comes this point where this poof, like the dandelion poof, it just disappears. And then the sense of relief that comes over you is just so profound. Yeah. Um, So yeah, if you have um, addictions or resentments or triggers or any kind of trauma that's coming up um, this month, really try to do the work, the hard work. And if you need help, get some help. There's so many recovery programs out there for literally everything. Um, You know, you don't necessarily have to go see a professional you can educate yourself, you can read books, you can use meditation, you can get out in nature. Um, It's just going to be a bit of a bumpy month. (laughs) Like, for me, um, I've had a lot of um, guilt come up, and I've had insomnia for the last week. And so what I've been doing is using gratitude. When I wake up in the middle of the night, like last night I woke up at one o'clock and I couldn't go back to sleep until 4.30 and then I had to get up at five. So it's like, so what I'll do is when I'm laying there, I'll, I'll use gratitude. Like I'll just feel where my body is touching the bed and, you know, thank you God for this bed. Thank you God for my husband. Thank you God for my animals. Thank you God for my house. And then it just relieves that uh, sense of, why am I awake right now? I'm going to be so tired tomorrow. And, you know, just complaining. And so if you use gratitude, it kind of eases that a little bit. So that's, that's an example um, of something that you could do and just, just be aware and be gentle with yourself and with other people. And uh, we'll get through it. Nobody's immune. Like I said, we all have to go. It's okay to cry. Oh yes. Cry. Oh my gosh. It's okay. Yeah. Cry. And and I will say like, I've, I've talked to people a lot about this concept of toxic positivity. You know, I think that's another thing that's big in the spiritual world. People don't understand if you are feeling upset, if you're feeling heartbroken, if there's an emotion coming up in you, it's an emotion that needs to be not projected. Don't project it onto other people because that's another form of escapism, but acknowledged. And sometimes we have to go sit in the corner and cry Mm -hmm. in order to actually feel that gross, uncomfortable. It doesn't, pain isn't comfortable at all. And this is something, again, I I tell in my courses, because with the yoga schools, people in the West have this very weird perception of yoga where they think it's about relaxation and comfort. And if you go to India, it's the exact opposite. We we are put into uh, physical postures that hurt and it's, it's supposed to trigger you. It's not because you're a gymnast. They do it better. As my teacher says, no one's paying you to do it. You know, this is a, it's, it's to trigger you. It's to trigger these help things in your body to start coming up. So then you can deal with it. Um, and then once you've left it, once you've allowed the, the, you know, and sometimes, uh, as I tell my students too, and I, my trauma therapist told this to me as well. And I agree, we don't have to know exactly what happened to cause that emotion. The important thing we do is deal with the emotion. Cause that's what the attachment is, is the feeling that you're feeling and why, why, keep, why am I, why am I feeling this way? Keep pulling back those layers. And, um, and it's, it's so uncomfortable and there might be a couple of days where your eyes are puffy and swollen. 
just put some ice on them. It's fine. You know, um, but it's, it's your, once you start to actually, I, I tell my students to lean into it a lot as well. I use that, that term a lot, lean into it. Um, the more you do that, the more liberated you become. Yes. Yes. I was, I was doing a lot of hip openers in my yoga practice. And the other day, I got done with my routine and um, I was in puppy pose and all of a sudden this emotion welled up and I just started bawling. I was bawling yeah. and I made this big puddle of tears and snot on my yoga mat and I had the hardest time wiping it up because it's. I bought this really expensive like foam yoga mat and Anyway, so now I have this like memory of this spot on my yoga mat where I had this huge emotional release from doing hip openers. And I tell you what, hip openers, well, I don't even know why I was crying, but something broke loose and came out and I just allowed it. I'm glad that nobody was home. <laughs> I, I never oh practice in front of anybody. I'm telling you right now, I, I practice by myself in the kitchen. I'm not really supposed to practice in front of people anyway, because there's supposed to be a boundary between you and your students. But yeah, I might, I'll tell you, I'll a little off subject, but my mat, I always use Manduka because that's what I recommend, but I've had mine, you know, their, their lifetime guarantee. Um, and I only wash my mat like once a year usually after I get back from India, it's like one of those, uh, iron skillets you never wash. Yeah. It smells so bad <laughs> and it's so grimy, but it's my grime. Uh -huh. And so like, that's another reason why I only, I practice by myself. So, because it's, it's, um, but yeah, it's very, yeah, the body, the hips are, hips are big because they're also attached to the lower back as well. That's kind of one big energy cycle. And you'll notice like as a teacher, like if you guys are practicing yoga, anytime there's a twist that's happening, especially um, if it's seated or in like Utita Trikonasana B, you'll watch people um, accidentally twist into their knee and not their hip and their back because they, the subconscious mind doesn't want to go into that yucky area. And so it pushes it into the knee, which is when people end up with knee issues. You know, which in, in the traditional yoga, we say injuries are your teachers. So when you have that issue happen, that's your body saying, hey, you've been using your knee and not your actual hip. You need to pay attention to that because it's all around that muladhara too. And that mulabunda, those, that root work of like, I am here for a reason, which a lot of us, I think I was telling Stephanie, if you keep pulling back the layers, most issues that people have that are uncomfortable really can be boiled down to you not feeling like you're enough. Yes. Yes. And you know, I think one of the hardest things about being a woman is that you're expected to work as if you don't have a home or a family or animals or children to take care of. And you're supposed to take care of your home and family and children and animals like you don't work. And it's yeah. like, it's a no win situation. Yeah. <laughs> so it's yeah, no win. It's, it's yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I feel you. Well, I don't have kids. I just have a dog, but, but you know, I, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. For sure. And I think, I think there's going to be a rebalance of the divine feminine coming into the, the uh, Jamie Slay called it earth 2.0. And I like that earth 2.0, you know, yes. where there's that rebalance. Yeah. Yes. So yeah, hips are big ones, guys. And backbends too. I know somebody asked me on my channel the other day about backbending. And I, all I'm going to say to you guys, make sure you find someone to help you with this because the body will, uh, David Grieg, my original teacher called it the artful dodger. When your, your subconscious mind knows where it's filed everything in your body, your subconscious mind knows that. And so when you start to go dig into those areas and the subconscious mind goes, Oh, we don't want to touch this. And then takes your body and shifts it out of alignment to artfully dodge the, the real potent stuff. And so for a lot of us, we do have these blind spots when we're working through that. And so having a teacher there to correct the blind spots and actually adjust you into it is very beneficial, very beneficial. For those of you living in states that still believe in the flu, um, do your best to find someone, <laughs> but, uh, but otherwise it's very beneficial to have someone actually move you. Yeah. Yes. I I've only had, um, assisted yoga a couple of times and I, I absolutely loved it. I, I really did. I, I wish that there was, um, I mean, there might be more stuff in my area. I just haven't looked at it, but I'm, I love the routine that I do. I'm kind of, 
attached to it. <laughs> I really miss it if I don't. Well, that's the important thing. So that's the one thing where, uh, well, not the one thing, there are many things that contemporary yoga gets completely wrong. Um, you need to have a set routine. Um, the old traditional systems of yoga, like an Ashtanga, we have six different series that we don't deviate, deviate from. And that's because these postures carry an alchemic response. And if you only do the posture like once a week or once in a while, it's not doing anything. There's potency, the more your body opens into the posture. And so like I tell my students who come in uh, to start like the primary series of Ashtanga Yoga, where you start, uh, it takes about five years to really work through before you then are start starting the second series. And that gives the body that that time to really settle in the mind more, more so the mind, because the mind controls the body to settle into these shapes and the alchemic response happening. If you're just doing it once, you're just skimming the surface. And um, and so, and you'll see that very, it's very common when someone starts a practice, they'll have a favorite posture. And then a year later, they usually hate that posture and a posture <laughs> they hate, they love now because the body's shifting, right? And so the mind is shifting and some different pathways are starting to open and be created in the body. And again, with those those pathways, it's like a bulldozer. It's, it's, there's going to be sensation. There's going to be feelings and um, stuff you have to kind of work through in order to, to continue to open those pathways. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. So just everybody be so, 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 so gentle on yourself. It's not a race. Shadow work is not a race, you know, whatever is coming up and presenting itself to you right now or this month, just focus on that. I know when I started healing um, about five years ago, I wanted it all done right now. I was really impatient and that impatience kind of prevented me or almost blocked me from moving forward. You know, it's like here, I was trying to hurry up and get this done and it just doesn't work that way. Um, so, you know, whatever is presenting itself to you, um, this month, just focus on that. Just focus yeah, on absolutely. that. Absolutely. You'll yeah. be done when you're dead. Basically it's constantly, <laughs> you're constantly, and the universe does have a wonderful way when you think that you've mastered something and you kind of get that little ego like oh I've gone through that oh then the universe comes in and goes oh really oh really my friend and like pulls the carpet out from under you so you always have to remain that hum remain humble in the sense that you are a human being and part of the being a human being is experiencing being a human being and all the um you know and yoga we talk about a lot with my students I talk about the concept of opposing forces and in the physical practice, the asana practice of yoga, we see a lot about opposing forces where one side of the body is creating strength while the other side of the body is opening and then it flips itself. And so there's this opposing force that's happening. Well, this represents, this is the micro of the macro. You as a human being are yourself an opposing force. You are an immortal soul. Your soul is never gonna die. It's eternal living in a shakti an expression of the soul the body that has limitations and has more uh, mortality to it and so that in itself creates that friction of opposing forces but the beautiful thing about that is it's designed that way by god for you to learn yourself mm -hmm. you have to be in these bodies that will eventually one day perish in order for us then to understand that we will never perish just because the body does, right. you know? And if the Shakti, if the body is the Shakti of the soul is the expression, that's why if you ever watch people talk about any type of past life regressions, they recognize people by their eyes in their hypnotherapy of who they were because the soul is always going to express itself the same in each body which is that eternal, eternal. But speaking of, I will say this, I, I, I uh, with the light bodies that we, we call it, that are coming in the light bodies, the activation, I've noticed for me, now I'm 39, I'll be 40 in February of 2023. And uh, the, again, the type of yoga that I teach and practice is a very, very physically challenging, a lot of leg behind the head, a lot of catching the ankle, a lot of sweat. I've broken my sacrum, my wrist. I mean, there's been a lot of, bruising um in this traditional form of yoga now i 
coming into my mid thirties, um, I started to feel the effects that maybe an athlete would feel, um, where I was developed, where I was having to slow down a little bit, uh, in some of, and I had a friend who was a good bit older than me or not that much older than me. Um, but she was telling me she'd be like 10 years older than me. She was like, Oh, Bryce, you're getting to that point where you're not going to be able to really do some of these postures you did when you were younger, you're going to start to get, have to get prepared for giving postures back basically. And so I was, I was getting ready for that. Like, that's where my mind was kind of going, which was fine. I'm not a post chaser. So that was fine. As long as I have a practice I'm, and I can still teach, I'm good. Well, then around lockdown, I was dealing with arthritis, all this stuff that you can chuck to being, you know, your age where you're all of a sudden my body started to reverse. I, everything started to reverse. And these last couple of years, I feel like my body is stronger now at 39 than it was at 29 yesterday when I was practicing, I was catching postures that I haven't caught in years, no problem. And then I heard somebody else say that that's a, that's a side effect of, that's another side effect of what's happening is your body's kind of regenerating itself. Have you found that too, Emmy? I have. I, I think that latent parts of our DNA are being activated by all of this light. Like for example, my hair, I've always had a little bit of a natural wave but the last two years, my hair has turned curly. Like I'll get in the shower, I'll get out, I'll scrunch my hair, let it air dry. And it is curly. Like I'll put in a couple of curls with a, a curling rod, you know, before I come on camera, but literally like two or three, that's it. So, and, and I've noticed that my, my skin is looking younger. I'm stronger. Like I can do regular push-ups. I've never been able to do regular push-ups. It was either, you know, up against the wall or, you know, on something, leaning on something. I always, always needed a little bit of help. Um, so yeah, I have noticed that too. And I was joking around with my husband and I'm like, I feel like I look younger now than I did five years ago. He's like, you do. I'm like, oh, that's how I'm feeling too. I, I feel that same way too. Now I still like, I use anti, you know, I have my little aging stuff I do and stuff, but I always do. I was like, oh my God, these I was starting to see like the crow's feet. Now they're starting to go away again. It's almost like, and I, and I, you know, I've always been thin. I'm Vata. I've always been thin, but when I was in Florida, like a few weeks ago, I put my bathing suit on and I was like, my stomach's flatter now than it was when I was 27. Like, what the hell is happening? Like, what is, and it's not like my, my uh, routine has changed. I've been active for years now, you know, it's, it's, um, but it's like that my body is like reversing an age, but we know that allegedly when we go into earth 2.0, we're possibly going to be living 400 years. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if that's the case, we're just whippersnappers. <laughs> we're still middle school. <laughs> <laughs> we're still middle schoolers yeah yeah and so and that's like but they say that even in the bible now we know a lot of people that are very fundamentalist bless their hearts <laughs> think we're at the apocalypse we're not at the apocalypse guys apocalypse was the fall of atlantis um and then we had the a thousand years of peace the golden age with tartaria which is why i'm telling people be careful with past life readings because most of our past our recent past was not what we think it was it was a golden age there was no then the devil was released again in the late 1700s and that's when we had this takeover of the controllers the powers that be and that's when life got shortened again but if you look in the bible it does talk about the activation of what we call light body which is the i believe the what we were talking about what's happening at this point and it's it's um you know we i i've heard of people that have grown a couple of inches um i've been told that um it and who knows but my first med bed treatment that i could be like five nine when i get out which makes sense because my dad's family's like gigantic. So <laughs> my granddad's like five. So um, you know, and so we're seeing this, this like almost like bodies are starting to kind of like wobble back into the original template of of where the soul wants to be to be in alignment. And um, and but that's gonna take time, guys. It's a, God or the universe isn't gonna come down and just give you everything you want in a silver platter you got to work for it. And I heard another, I don't know if you've heard this. I mean, I've heard another astrologer say that with like the idea of the med beds, you can't even use the med beds unless you're at a certain frequency. Yeah. Like it, 
like it just won't work. Won't work. Yeah. 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 We we've got to, we've got to clear ourselves out and everybody has trauma. I mean, even, even if, even if you've had like the, the perfect life and nothing ever bad happened to you, your trauma is that you don't have trauma. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we're all, we're all social beings. We all want to be like everybody else, you know, and if you're different in any way, it's a bit of a trauma. Yeah. You know, yeah. so. And you could be carrying over stuff from a, a past existence. But again, I said this with Catherine Edwards yesterday. It doesn't matter what actually happened. What, what matters is your sensation from that event and you dealing with it now because you aren't the person of the past. You are now in this body. And so you have like I used a silly example yesterday, but I have a fear of rats and I don't know where this fear came from. There's no logical explanation. I've, I've had this intense fear since I was a child. I used to have like nightmares at night about rats. I don't know why. I mean, I grew up in a very nice home. Like there was no like infiltration, like never, never made sense to me. So I, I'm just assuming that it's probably a past life trauma that happened. Doesn't yeah. matter what happened. Um, what mattered, and I was telling Catherine when I was like 20 years ago, I was in uh, South Africa and a rat ran across the floor and it was concrete floor. And I passed out. That's how bad my fear was. And I hit the concrete floor. And at that point, even 20 years ago, when I was super young, I was like, I have to deal with this because rats are everywhere. I've always lived in cities. Hello. Rats are all over. I mean, I've lived behind a restaurant. I think the only reason why I've never seen a rat here is because I'm a dog, but I live literally behind a restaurant in the middle of Midtown Atlanta, like it, there are restaurants everywhere. And so um, I actively started, even at that young of an age, I actively started to work on that fear. It didn't matter to me what happened to cause that fear. What mattered was what I, what I was doing it, it in this life as Bryce. So I put myself in situations, very controlled situations like when I lived in London for a little bit, if anybody lives in London, you know, you go to the underground and you can look down where the tube goes by and see rats and mice and rodents just running around. And so I'd force myself to go and kind of watch that and allow myself to breathe and calm the nervous system down. And as I was telling Catherine yesterday, it's not like I'm probably never going to have a pet rat, but I've actively, I'm actively working on that fear to, to breathe through it, to incorporate it, to release it, right? Like that dandelion to release it for whatever happened to cause that situation. And probably if I had to guess, I was probably tortured with rats, but it wasn't the rat's fault. Right. And working through that distrust that cut, you know, and all that stuff that, that it triggers. And so that's what I want people to understand too. Like past lives are interesting. They're fascinating, all that kind of stuff. But in some ways they don't matter because right now you're here in this life. What matters is what you do now with those sensations, right? right? That's, a, we're going to have memories. That's another thing about these solar flat, like they're called, I'm having a lot of memories like of Atlantis, actually. I know it's Atlantis. Um, we're starting to, our, our Akashic records are starting to release fully into our cognitive uh, reality because it's stored in our DNA as well. And so, um, and so that the, all that information will come, but sometimes it doesn't matter. Sometimes it doesn't matter if you remember or not, you just have to work with what you have because that's what's, what you, what's presented to you is what's important. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I think it can be a distraction going into past lives. Cause you know, we're all so curious, like, who was I, what did I do? You know, but what's really important is to heal the stuff that you carry from your past life. That's what's important. Knowing everything that you did, exactly where you lived, who you were with, you know, that's, that's all fun and everything, but it's, it's a bit of a distraction. And in fact, past life memories were the trigger to my awakening, actually, two and a half years ago, um, I started having memories and they were so profound. Like it was, it was a sensation felt, you know, here. And it was so intense and so strong. I could not deny it. I yeah. could not deny it. But at the time I was still, you know, very much religious, religiously indoctrinated. Yeah. And so that's when this, the wrestling began with the changes in my beliefs. It's like, um, I have dealt with narcissism and I've done a lot of counseling to, you know, reprogram my, my brain because I, I kind of grew up with a narcissist 
And, um, you know, it's just really important not to gaslight yourself. And I didn't want to gaslight myself. Like I didn't want to say, you know, oh, this stuff can't be true, you know, because, the church teaches that we live once and, you know, we either go to heaven or hell, depending on, you know, if we know Jesus and claim his, him as our savior. Yeah. And so what do what, what do you, what does a Christian person do with past life memories? Like, right. what do you do with that? Yeah. And so it, it was, it was quite mind blowing and quite shocking and painful and lonely because the people that I chose to talk to first about it were like not the right people, (laughs) you know? So I I really had to go through this um, period of pulling away from the people that I was friends with and finding new people, you know, to, to support and, and love and grow with. And it was quite a process, (laughs) quite a process for sure. My grandmother, who my one grandparent, who's actually from Georgia, my mom's family is from the coast of South Carolina. My dad's dad is from Tennessee, but my, my dad's mom grew up in South Georgia on a dairy farm uh, that her ancestors came up through New Orleans, allegedly, we're learning that history might be wrong too, because of, because of Tartaria, but, um, you know, French descent, uh, and she, <sighs> She would hide, thank God for her, because I don't know where I would be without her. She's recently passed away, but she would hide books on reincarnation under the bed, under her side of the bed from my grandfather because he was a Presbyterian. And she went to church every Sunday, but she would talk to me as even as a little kid. I don't know if she, if my cousins are watching, let me know if she talked to y'all too, but she definitely talked to me a lot. She would pull me aside and talk to me about reincarnation and talk to me about all these things. Um, and she was a very smart woman. She uh, was a therapist for years, a pianist, like she very high level of education for that time period for women. And she would read all these books on the way energy works. And um, I, I really, I mean, thank God for her because I don't know if I would have felt the freedom to go off to India if I hadn't have had her because you're right when you are, I mean, even my family, I mean, my, in the South, there's, you know, you have your fundamentalist and then you have your, your other Christians, which are more, I mean, my family was into the folklore. We told ghost stories, all that kind of stuff. The more of the um, midnight in the garden of good and evil type of family, Southern family, not the fundamentalist, but still that those, t- those type of uh, subjects like reincarnation were taboo mm-hmm. because that's not what you are taught in the church. Um, which I know you're doing, are you doing a series with Stephanie about t- taboo um, topics in the Bible? Yeah, we were, we were going to record our introductory session yesterday, but like you were saying, she's feeling under the weather. So we postponed it, but yeah, we're going to, it's going to be titled uh, religion versus spirituality. And we're going to be talking about all kinds of different taboo topics. And I'm going to tie things together biblically and share some really cool old books that I discovered about astrology and how they're tied together with, um, Bible verses. It's really fascinating. Really. Well, they talk about reincarnation actually a lot in the Bible and people don't realize it. That's what they're talking about. Mm-hmm. I mean, even Jesus says in one of the stories, like, who do they say I am? And his disciples answer back. They say that you were the prophet Isaiah or mm-hmm. Isaac, one of them, which lived hundreds of years before Jesus. So what does that tell you? Right. That they believed in reincarnation. Right. That's and- what that tells you. In Job too, the book of Job, I don't know the book or the verse off hand right now, but he says, you know, I came naked in my mother's womb and I'll come naked and I'll, I'll return naked. So he's, how, how else do you take that? You, you come naked from one mother and you return naked through another. Exactly. So, <laughs> I'm kind of crew guys, but I had a teacher, a yoga teacher say once, what if walking into the light is you just going down the birth canal out of the vagina again. (laughs) (laughs) That's why all these people, my babies come out like flicking off cameras, like that was a trick. (laughs) (laughs) It's you coming out the birth canal. You see the light, you walk into it and boom, all of a sudden you're out the birth canal. (laughs) But um, I was laughing when he said that. I was like, actually, 
maybe i don't know yeah. <laughs> but, but you know it's what's interesting in my studies of tartaria they talk a lot about i know stephanie i've talked about this how a lot of the christian faith what we see as the christian faith is actually is actually a manipulation of the egyptian faiths and that we've been taught that like isis and osiris that these religions are bad but actually that's where Yahshua and Mary Magdalene was raised, was in these Osiris and Isis religions of Egypt, not in the Jewish faith. Um, it was all very much like manipulated. But if you look into Tartaria too, one of the most interesting things I found is during Tartaria, because it was the thousand years of peace, the golden age, everyone had the same faith. There was no religion. Everyone knew the same. We all knew everything about what was going on. There was no, there was no controllers. There was no you know, dark cult at that point, they were off, there was a thousand years between the fall of Atlantis and where we are now, where they had to leave the planet. This is in Revelation as well. That was the deal. That was the deal between the light and the dark. And so we knew everything. There was nothing that was taken from us as far as our, we understood vibration. We understood what source was. We understood the firmament. We understood, we, if you look at the, the graphs, they knew there was a purple sky, which a lot of people are having visions whether they're visions or memories, I don't know, of a purple sky. We know the blue is the firmament. And if you look at the graphs of Tartaria, they had a purple sky, like the Prince song. Thank you for the subscriber who pointed this out, where in 1999, he says the sky was turning purple. There were people running everywhere. And so when you start to look at that, and then the mud floods came, which was the releasing of the darkness again, which was the agreement uh, that wiped everyone out. And then at the late in the 1700s and the people were placed back on the earth, all of a sudden we have this manipulation. But, um, but all of that is in our memory. And I think that's another thing we're going to be accessing too, is that all of a sudden we're going to understand things that we understood in Tartaria. We're going to start to deep, deep down know, I think we already know deep down what we did the, then, you know, it's just moving through this amnesia, amne amniotic veil. And yes, reincarnation, because if you look at the Atlantean religions, those were all the Egyptian religions. And so reincarnation was very much taught. It was accepted. And I know from my time in India, like if you see an Indian funeral, they take the body of the person who's passed. And it's almost like a, it looks as an outsider looking in, it's like a parade. There's music playing, they parade the body. And then they take the body, they always, uh, burn the bodies they stop on the skull to release the spirit and they then they burn the body and what i've noticed as a westerner who was taught to have all this fear because we i grew up in a church where there was heaven or hell is in the hindu culture from my perception looking in it seems that that fear isn't really as much there because they're taught from day one about reincarnation so what's to fear if you know that you're never going to die? Mm -hmm. What's to yeah. fear? You know, and so it's a celebration of, of that life. And you're going to see each other again. You know, as far as past lives are concerned, if you feel a closeness to someone, yeah, you probably did have a past with them. There probably is a soul contract with them. But what's important is what you do with it now, not what happened then. Now. Right. Yeah. Right. So it's exciting, even though this week's, this month's going to be a um, bit of a shit show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just, just take it easy. Maybe slow down, maybe clear as much as you can from your schedules. Just take it easy. Just slow down. Just observe yourself, observe others. Don't attach to what's coming up. Um, it's just old stuff. It's just, it's the soap bubbling over the, the cup. <laughs> yeah. If we got any young people watching that are in the, the dating field right now, I would definitely suggest not starting a new relationship this month. <laughs> yeah, perhaps hold off a couple months on that one. <laughs> and I'll, I'll also unless you want to see if it'll survive the test of time. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe wait till June. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I know astrologically, I was listening to somebody, we, we were talking about twin flames last time. I was listening to another person speak about that. I know astrologically, the end of June is like the last cycle for twins to come together again, astrologically until the fall. So there's even astrological things around that as well. And so if it doesn't happen by the, if you are someone who's on a twin flame journey and that connection doesn't happen by the end of June, it's probably, there's probably not going to be another window of opportunity until the fall. 
which is interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. That is, yeah. you know, you know, it's really interesting before I, before I knew my husband and I were on a twin flame journey, we got married six seventeen in Gemini. And it's like, and this is before I even knew anything about astrology. And, and when I did our, our sinistry chart and our union chart, it was just like mind blowing, yeah. mind blowing, you know, his North node and point of vertex are in my seventh house, which is marriage and relationships. Yep. My North North node and point of vertex, depending on how you do the houses, is in his seventh house and his 12th house, which is spirituality and endings. It's like, it is insane. It is insane when you're on this journey and you start to figure things out and you put things together. And I started to get into astrology and I did our charts like this. And I was just like, what? Yeah. It already does it for you. The universe is always already working for you, whether you know you know, that's Dharma too. We, I talk a lot about Dharma. Dharma is your divine path and there is nothing that can really shake that. You can resist it and cause issues yourself, but there's already a divine um, agreement that's been made uh, before you took your incarnation. And that's the Bhagavad Gita covers that a lot about that. Um, it's your Dharma and Dharma is powerful. And so you have Dharma with other people too. I love my Dharmic relationships. Karmic relationships are interesting dharmic relationships are powerful mm. because you you're just a dharmic relationship is a relationship where you're just your souls are just in it mm -hmm. and if you're a twin it's you're the same soul that's split into two so um which is kind of it's kind of psychotic if you think about it <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so i'm like so do I, well i have memories of what he went through like how does this work <laughs> like, yeah yeah. Right. <laughs> Cause oh, my right. half has been enough. I, I deserve enough. Like, I don't want to have to also deal with that half too, but, but, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but all right, guys, well, I will put again, all of Emmy's links down in the description box below, please go subscribe to her channel. And if you are contacting her for any type of healing work, uh, charts, Reiki, just again, know that, yeah, it, running doing chart I know doing charts takes takes a lot but also running a channel takes a lot too so just be very very patient um we we all have the same amount of time in the day as everybody else does and so um just be very patient uh and you will you will you will get attended to um just be patient so all right thank you so much Emmy I look forward to our next one and I can't wait for you and Stephanie's um series on uh the taboo yeah, that's, gonna be, that's gonna be fun yeah <laughs> so all right guys have a wonderful wonderful friday uh buckle up keep your head held high and remember to breathe and one of my favorite mantras of all time is this too shall pass amen oh. sister oh man i said that last night about 10 times <laughs> my mama used to say that to us all the time this too shall pass so yep. just easy does it first things first live and let live like i use these models all the time <laughs> love it love it all yeah. right guys actually down in the description or down in the comment section let us know guys what are some mantras that you know that you use to get you through turbulent times so Anyway, all right, we'll talk to you soon, guys. Bye. Bye.